podcast which as always is coming to you from Wrocław well I say as always uh, um, sometimes I've been in other places and I won't be here for much longer so I'll be uh, well I'll be back again in uh, possibly at the end of September or October but I shall be shortly leaving on my summer tour and um, anyway Sorry, that was the. Uh, I've, I've got my own video on coming up, and um, the, uh, so I can see the questions as they come through. Yesterday, I did a video on something called the Regna Telegram, and the uh, Regna Telegram was a warning of the Holocaust. It's one of these, one of um, very few bits of information that is often seen as being uh, a way that uh, people in occupied Europe attempted to warn of what was happening and uh, like everything else uh, it was uh, not believed. I wouldn't say like everything else maybe that's a bit unfair of me but like many things it was just not believed. Anyway I'll just read it to uh, to you now because this this uh, what it says is uh, Obviously, it's got, um, it's quite important. Now, this um, telegram was sent in August of 1942, uh, which uh, was probably the bloodiest uh, month for the entire Holocaust. I mean, there's other, maybe you could just say the de time of the uh, deportations from Hungary in, in the uh, early summer of 1944. That could also have been maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe May of 44. Uh, was also an uh, extremely deadly month. But I mean, August of 1942, uh, we saw, for example, the trains going into Treblinka with the ghettos in, in Warsaw, Radom, and other places being emptied and sent there. At uh, same time as uh, trains, loads of people were going to Bozhets and uh, to Sobibor, and of course the death camp at Helmand Adnerim was working overtime. So anyway, to read the re uh, the the telegram, received alarming reports stating that in the Führer's headquarters a plan has been discussed and is under consideration, according to which all Jews not countries occupied or controlled by Germany, numbering three and a half to four millions, should after deportation and concentration in the East be at one blow exterminated, in order to resolve once and for all the Jewish question in Europe. Action is reported to, to be planned for the autumn. Ways of execution are still being discussed, including the use of prussic acid. We transmit this information with all the necessary reservation as exactitude cannot be confirmed by us. Our informant is reported as our close connections with the highest German authorities and his reports are generally reliable. Please inform and consult New York. Um, right, okay, so, uh, well, I uh, see you already a good question. Uh, and, um, okay, uh, the problem with this telegram is it just doesn't give any details and it doesn't really make much sense and i do appreciate the reasons for that but in view of how important it was then uh, maybe uh, something a bit more exact needed to be sent but of course that wasn't all that easy for anybody to come up with any proof so what we've got here the telegraph says uh, telegram, I should say, says that it comes from the highest levels in the Nazi uh, leadership. So it comes from the Führer's um, uh, headquarters himself. The plan is being discussed there, or was discussed, and uh, so and that all the Jews in lands occupied by Germany, that's the Sith three and a half to four million people are to be taken to a place in the east whatever that may mean and then be exterminated and um so in order to murder all the jews in europe in fact they do use this word the jewish question in europe which is comes from uh which comes from uh um uh, the word in german okay it's the regner telegram regner um, so, uh, it's the plan is due to begin in the autumn of 1942, um, so it already started, uh, but it does say the use of prussic acid, 
and prussic acid um which uh, had been used uh in uh in the past in fact even used in 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 uh, in, in the united states for example for cleaning up railway cars in the 30s uh the Pate 1905 um i've heard all sorts of other dates actually used but uh, it, it it's um 1905 and um therefore it is um uh, it was known but the thing was when this uh, tele telegraph arrived that wasn't believed but i need the, it's the final bit really it says we transmit this information all necessary act reservations that like, cannot be confirmed by us our informant is reported to have close connections with the highest general authorities and reports are generally act reliable uh so in other words what they're saying is that there's a plan apparently there's a plan and uh the person who told us about this plan um uh, whom we can't name uh usually usually reports um in a uh, reliable manner in other words that the what they're saying they in the telegram itself they're saying well we think there's a plan but we don't really know it's like it's, there's some bloke in the pub and he reckons that this that and the other and um yeah so uh so that uh that is um that's the uh that uh, it at the end of the day what did they how did they expect people to react at the other point so i'll just a minute i'll just respond to this and um oh, oh, uh, uh, questions here uh so it's the regna tele telegram from august 1942 prussic acid is noted known best by its brand name of zyklon b which is the, of course the way that people were murdered in Auschwitz and at Majdanek. Now, the person who actually brought this information to Switzerland at great risk to himself was Edward Schulter, who was a well-known German businessman. He was so well-known that when the Nazis uh, were attempting to seize power in February uh, 1933, he was invited um to uh contribute along with 23 other bi german business leaders to the nazi election fund and so there was a meeting it was it's often called the secret meeting at goering's place it was um uh, organized goering von papen and uh and others and uh and the head of the reichsbank and the uh, the idea was to get the cash to make sure that the Nazis had enough money to see them through the election campaign for March 1933. And then Goering promised uh, that the... Um, I well, didn't promise exactly, but he suggested that this would be the last election for some time, maybe even for 100 years. And so anyway... Uh, there were a number of concerns actually paid up. They were normally people, they're mainly people in the uh, mining uh, industry. Anyway, I did a separate video on that. Uh, but the um, the this uh, the the hub of business life, I would have to say, in Germany was probably Dusseldorf, or at least the rural area. It wasn't Berlin. Uh, Berlin was an administrative centre. It was a historic, or is a historic capital. Uh, even today, it's even less of a industrial centre than it was then. The industrial might of Germany was uh, in the west, and the uh, Edward Schulter, who gave this information. Uh, he'd had quite a um, business career and uh, he came from a quite a wealthy background. But because uh, he, he had an accident, uh, was a, um, one of these uh, mine tra tra uh, carriages to have in on mines, and that sort of ran over his uh, leg. And as a result, uh, he only had one leg. Uh, his foot had to be amputated and, and then he had to take off the uh, part of his uh, his leg as well. I don't, I don't understand the medical bits uh, to this one. But but he, he didn't fight in World War One, uh, And he had, he, age 25, in 1916, he was in charge of fats production in the for the German war office. So, I mean, that's quite a major achievement 
uh, at that age. He was running Sunlight, Sunleashed, the washing up, well now it's best known for washing up uh, um, um, liquid, uh, but then it was a soap company uh, that was based in Mannheim, which is near Frankfurt, uh, to the 300 kilometers to the south of uh, Dusseldorf. And uh, so he had had uh, quite a um a, a, a major career and the company he was then uh, a managing director of uh, they had huge holdings mining uh he was above all his um interest in the zinc mining uh, which was from here here from Wrocław this is where he was then by this time of the Sentinel Louis based here and uh zinc mining was in Silesia and so that was how he got to uh um uh, find out. So I've just got an explanation here from the Holocaust and Excitlopedia. The right week in the telegram was a short message sent from Switzerland to the governments of Great Britain and the United States in August 1942. Well, if that's what the Holocaust in Encyclopedia says, um, it's wrong. And uh, you can, I, um, I'm, I'm surprised that the Holocaust Encyclopedia actually says that because uh, um, all they had to do was to read it and it clearly is not sent uh, to the governments of the United Kingdom and United States. The Regna telegram was sent to a British member of Parliament called Sidney Silverman. Uh, he was a Labour member of Parliament. He'd been in Parliament since 1935. He's quite well known for his later career uh, because it was he um, who, who got the death penalty um lifted in the united kingdom or at least it was it was suspended uh, around 1964 and um it was largely due to his his work so that's his his claim to fame uh he was also uh, involved in the uh campaign for nuclear disarmament uh, which uh, he, i don't know if he's one of the founders but he was he was he was noted for that of course um uh that's given given what happened in in the second world war he he had been a pacifist in the first world war and um uh in in the second world war uh in fact he went to prison he was in three prisons belfast norwich maybe i can't remember and, and another one i can't remember which, but he was from liverpool uh he was born in 18 uh, 1895 his parents came from yassi in romania and uh, they must have been quite impoverished, but his father was a tailor. But having said that, he managed to go to university, which was himself. He obviously got a, he got um, money for uh, he got a um, stipendium. A, it's not English. What's that? He got he got a grant, and he was able to go to um, to university. So uh, from that point of view, uh, he he he'd been quite fortunate. He managed to pull his way up, work his way up. Um, and I suppose his father was also quite a good draper because he he did manage uh, to make himself and his presence felt in in in, Liver, in Liverpool. The other part was not also not the other uh, two telegrams were sent. The other telegram was sent to the United States, but this one got, was delayed. The re reason why it was delayed was because the American uh, embassy in uh, a consulate I should say in Geneva uh, wasn't uh, happy about passing on messages for Gerhard Riegner and so this one was sent to Stephen Wise who was a rabbi and um, he, he was the head of the World Jewish Congress and uh, as such he had um, uh, friends such as uh, uh, Frank, Mr. Frank Furter, I forgot his first name, it'll come back to me, uh, who was uh, on the uh, Supreme Court of the United States and thus knew Roosevelt. Now, what's important about this is the fact that, uh, first of all, it's the attitude of the United States, but also when it goes to, uh, when it actually gets to the United States. In 1933, there had been major protests in the streets in the in New York and in other places, including big fights uh, between um, uh, Nazis and anti-Nazis, so because the American Nazi Party had uh, quite a lot of say. And um, uh, the strange thing is that by 1942, when the Holocaust is actually taking place, Frankfurter, for example. Uh, he he uh, he obviously brought this telegram to the attention of Roosevelt, or at least that's what we assume. But uh, when Jan Karski, who was a Polish courier, 
and Karski had been in the Warsaw ghetto just to, to he visited it he saw what was happening there he also uh, saw in a transit camp in his it was often said he claimed to have been in Belzec but it clearly it wasn't Belzec it was it was his pizza and he saw uh, what was happening with these deportations in August of 1942 he made it to the United States and when he was talking to Frankfurter, Frankfurter said he didn't believe him. And later he sort of tried to justify it, saying, well, it wasn't I didn't believe him, I didn't believe uh, it, it was happening, uh, which is a slight difference. Obviously, it's not saying, it's not saying that you're lying. Uh, he's saying that he didn't, he didn't believe it could possibly be happening. So, therefore... Um, the attitude had changed from the, this 1933 wanting a boycott of Nazi Germany to 1942 when the situation as well, uh, you know, it's a bit, it all sounds a bit far-fetched this. The thing is uh, that Edvard Schulter himself, he told Regner about uh, Auschwitz and he didn't use say Auschwitz by name but he did describe the construction of a very large camp and he did describe the, the, the construction of uh, large crematoria. Now, the, this happened, uh, in, or the plans for large crematoria, which incidentally were built after the uh, telegram was actually sent. And therefore, the, uh, what, what, um, the information clearly is correct, but Regner didn't want to be seen to be exaggerating what was happening at all so Irigna was very delicate in the way he actually did it Regna also had another problem he was German he um, uh, he w was at university in 33 or 34 when some some Nazi students and student there was a Nazi student body was quite strong uh, so the, and they they threw him out of a window. I suspect after that happening to him, he decided uh, it wasn't a good place to, uh, to be. Uh, Berlin, that is a Berlin University. He went to live in Switzerland. But as a foreigner, he would have been under police invigilation from time to time, particularly as there was a war on. Uh, I knew uh, somebody who studied with me at university. Now he studied in. Uh, he was retired, but he had fled to Switzerland in 1938 from Austria and uh, he was he was kicked out of the country and um, the thing was his passport didn't have a J in it uh, so he, he, he wasn't marked as being a Jew but when um, he was he was packing the um, uh, he, he was being forced to get on the uh, the, the the train to leave. The uh, customs of, or the police official insulted him for being Jewish. So uh, f uh, so he, he could for one part he couldn't say he couldn't uh, claim to be a refugee, but on the other part he claimed to, he had to pretend to be a tourist. But they they clearly knew that he 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 was he was he was Jewish. Now anyway, he survived by getting on a Kinder transporter. And he ended up in the United Kingdom and then he served in the British Army during the Second World War. He was captured on the 7th of June 1944 and then spent uh, 10 months uh, in a POW camp. But once he was in the POW camp, uh, he, 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 he pretended he couldn't speak German. And uh, anyway, he, he got away with it. Um, so, uh, um, the... I think the question about the Regner telegram is is that I can understand what the Allies I and mean, what they're going to do. They've got this telegram. What do you want us to say about it? This was the this was the problem. It was the lack of information. Uh, Regner and Schulter clearly expected people to react, but they didn't know how they should react. And the fact that um, and so it really it makes it makes a lot of uh, it makes a lot of sense that nothing could be done. So look. What could they? What could they say? What could church say? Look, we've got this telegram that says the following, um, and it really. What could he do? So this this was this was this was the problem. Um, another thing that uh, Regner actually did say, uh, he gave two interview. He must have given lots of interviews in his life because he was later head of head of the World Jewish Con Congress himself uh, for in for quite a long time. But there's two interviews which I think are important. One was he uh, Yehuda. Uh, Bauer, who is a, an Israeli uh, historian, he's now 97. He was born in Czechos uh, Czechoslovakia in 19... 
25, I think it was, 26, 26. And uh, he escaped from Czechoslovakia, or his parents did, and took him along with him uh, on the day that the Nazis uh, moved uh, moved in. I'll, I'll come to that question then. Um, so he, esca he escaped, and then he he's, he's really a very distinguished uh, historian. Anyway, so a large part of what I actually wrote and I said yesterday uh, was based on uh, his research. To, uh, he, he's the number one person in this, although he did actually get the name of the uh, head of the World Jewish Congress wrong. And um, and it was a rather important bit here because the head of the uh, Con World Jewish Congress had a brother. They were both uh, Germans, but um, his brother was a... Uh, I've forgotten his name. I've got the name, name George in my mind. It wasn't George. Anyways, the, the brother was called Paul Guggenheim. He was the lawyer who advised the, um, the the World Jewish Congress. And it was the lawyer who advised and Paul Guggenheim who told him to put this bit in about the, uh, you know, to put these caveats in. Well, we don't really know, but we think about it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I saw you. You've been asked to read the telegram. I did actually, uh, I did actually do that. <laughs> I'll come to that one then. Um, so the um, uh, anyway, I think the the, the reading the telegram. Uh, I just honestly can't see uh, what the further what they could have done. Anyway, so the second uh, interview was in the Spiegel. Now this w was done. It was published, I think, after his death in two thousand and one, and in the dish. No, sorry, that can't be right. He died in two thousand, died in two thousand and four, two thousand and one. I forgot the name. Of it. Anyway, just before he died, uh, he gave an interview to the Spiegel, and in the De Spiegel interview, uh, in this case, he says about the uh, 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 because his hands were tied, he couldn't actually do a great deal. The lawyer told him to do this. Uh, he was living in in, in um, what must have been uh, more, uh, terror for him. I mean, he, he was only living only four kilometers from the border. He could have been deported at any time, and um, so it, it must have been very very difficult for him. And also, uh, he couldn't have direct contact with people like Edward Schulter just in case they thought this. This authorities thought that he was a German agent. So it was it was very very difficult uh so uh, my conclusion on this one is that uh, i can't honestly see what difference it would have been made now i will look at other warnings uh of the holocaust uh uh for example uh the most interesting case the one i think is the it was a bbc um broadcast which was on i think it was the 20th of june 1942 when uh now unfortunately i've only got this in the po in the polish i haven't got it in english I've been looking for it in English and I just can't find it. Um, so I've got a translation. So I did a back uh, translated it back. I can read Polish without any problem, of course. But uh, uh, but then it w it won't be the same. The there was a copy of it was made in the Ringelblum ar archive. Mr. Ringelblum, Emanuel Ringelblum, was in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was a historian and he realised he was living in historic times and therefore he decided to take a record of everything that was going on in the ghetto. So and he saved it all and he made three archival deposits. Uh, one, for example, in a milk churn which turned up in 1950 it was a, the, another one turned up in 1946 just after the second world war and a third part of the ringelblum archive is now believed to be in the garden of the embassy of china in warsaw uh, but it hasn't been found and the, uh, i was at a conference about 20 years ago when they said the chinese were going to allow them to dig in the garden dig the garden up but they clearly they they never did so it still remains uh, unfound. But the part of the Ringelblum archive where he makes a note of this BBC broadcast, which t says quite clearly what was happening at Helmland, at Nerem, um, Kulmhof, uh, that people were there being murdered in gas vans, that is made. And that is a very interesting and uh, accurate account of what was happening indeed i came across um, uh, records of uh, it would seem that there, there was claims made on that the british agents had been in the area and had even been a car chase and uh, this is something i've only come up with archival records i never heard anybody else actually repeated it in a historical sense so um 
uh, but but there are records actually made um, on that part about it. Um, and there was a Daily Telegraph article towards the end of 1942 which described uh, that, that how many people had been killed um, and it was an under-exaggeration, but anyway. Okay, good, I'll come on to that one later. Good, right, sorry. Uh, um, uh, okay, so, so I eat out often asked me to read the telegram. It is actually, if you look at the description, the, the telegram is, I wrote down the telegram there. Uh, so you can actually see it there. I did actually say it at the beginning of the video, but I, I do appreciate people come in and out. And um, uh, so uh, Ben asks, how long will the war in Ukraine last for? I can say this, Ben, um, I don't know, but um, I, um, I think it's going to last a lot longer. And the reason I say that is even if, uh, unless something miraculous occurs, and lots of talk of a, um, an offensive, and uh, which is never a good thing uh, but telling the enemy um what you're going to do but the the even if even if it comes a fantastic result even like it wasn't a kharkiv um attack in the in september uh, of last year uh, even if it, it, it does end up in liberating large parts of ukraine uh, this will not end the war and um first of all uh, if, we, if we're talking of re recuperating all of Ukrainian territory, uh, that would have to include Crimea. And that, I mean, that's just not possible, uh, with the, in my opinion, with the equipment that they've, they've, uh, the Ukra Ukraine's got. I don't think it's got the way of making a successful attack. It's very uh, difficult to attack Crimea. It's very easily defended. And um, so, so the, the, the points which... It, 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 the entry to Crimea is a tiny. Then again, in the Second World War, um, it was uh, it pierced uh, not only by the Nazis in 1941, but then again by the Red Army in 1944. So, it, so it is possible to pierce it, but but I don't know. The Crimea is pretty big, and um, so I I can't see I I can't see this. I I think this that it, this war is likely to go last a very long time. What clearly what Putin wants is if this become a frozen conflict. Uh, that's how he will actually benefit benefit from this financially. He'll benefit from it politically. Uh, what Putin needs to do, like everybody on the far the hard uh, far right, the 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 the, the nationalists, or uh, well, even even on the hard left, far left as well. But I mean, all, all dictators they want to say that the country is in danger. We everybody's got to stick together. This is the and uh, okay. George Orwell wrote about in 1984. Okay, that was a um, that was. Um, fiction but uh that's how it works everybody's in together we must all stick together um we must look be careful to find the enemy within us as well so this is the whole point uh i think so that's what putin wants even if the russians are completely kicked out of ukraine that would not bring peace that they wouldn't just say okay that's it and um uh so anyway so i think that this is like to last a very long time um unless russia is liberated and the only people can do that i think are the russians i think it'll be it's a bit unrealistic expect the ukrainians to liberate russia i do appreciate now there are uh openly russian units in the um in 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 the in ukraine have shown themselves but i mean the, i mean i came across russians uh more than a year ago in ukraine so um uh i think there on the uh, 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 it was pretty obvious but uh outside and uh, not so much okay so i hope i've answered that question and uh, do i have good air conditioning in my van i don't have air conditioning in my van at all i have got uh humidif uh, like a thing which humidifies the air you use water you put water in it and the water goes down when it gets really hot but quite honestly it's not necessary i've got a fantastic above me uh big um window uh and so if i want anything i there's a window here on this side as well and if i uh, if i want to sit with a um a breeze i open the window beside me and it's got a mosquito net, of course, there. And it's got a mosquito net above it as well. Um, I can't yet open the door. Uh, the door needs... Sorry, I can open the door. I can't leave the door open. It needs a little bit of work doing on it uh, to, to make sure it stays open. So uh, 
uh, anyway uh, that's my air conditioning um, it's better to use fans now here I'm on a campsite I've got access to um, 230 volts shore power but uh, if the thing is this you're having air conditioning on in the motorhome you can only how you're going to power it and uh, the batteries i mean i've got quite a lot of battery power in here i've got because i need it obviously for computers and all the rest of it but if i had the air conditioning on it then it wouldn't last very long. so anyway i hope that uh, answered that question um yeah right so so well thanks very much for for listening and uh, that was i'll do another ukraine war thing because there's a couple of things i want to talk about i really want to talk about belarus and uh, a number of things have happened there in the last few days and as i actually read the uh, russian um uh russian press um i i think uh, i i might be i might have one or two things to say which haven't been said elsewhere i do try to say things which are original i don't want to actually uh come on the internet and then so just repeat something that somebody else has already said uh, I, I try to be able to think this out for myself and as far as this belgorod raid is concerned i said something which no one else was said i accept the fact that uh, what i said was now being shown to be incorrect even though i uh i do find the whole thing somewhat suspicious okay Thanks very much for being here. I'll do another um, live chat tomorrow. And uh, so for the moment, uh, uh, all the best from me in Poland. And thanks for uh, thanks for watching. And uh, bye for now. Oh, and if you haven't seen it, see yesterday's video. Because that's the one that goes in the, into depth into the Arena Telegram. Thank you. Bye.